this squashing diversity, equity, inclusion bugs in open source projects. Um, I wanted to give this together with Anita Sama, who unfortunately is traveling to another conference and could not be here. So, but I want to thank her very much for for all the work that she has done, and I would not be presenting on this because I, I learned pretty much all of it from her. So, super excited. The idea of diversity, equity, inclusion bugs, though, I attribute to Emma Irvin introducing me to. So, I want to make sure that is, uh, I give credit there. So, one of the things that we know in open source is that we are um, having some challenges. And we know, well, specifically there's a gender imbalance. And we have different surveys over the last decade that have come out. Um, this one from GitHub's open source survey six years ago found 95% of respondents to their survey were men only 3% identified as women. We had a survey from Mozilla that was better or, or more, I don't want to say better, it was more equal in representation with 58% male and 33 identifying as female and 9% as other. The OpenStack Community Report from 2018 found that 10% identified as female. And at the code contributions level, it was 7 to 8%. But then at the leadership and governance level, it looked, again, I would say better because I'm biased and I have my own preferences, 20% uh, identified as female. So over the, the years, there have been lots of recommendations. What do we do about this situation? How do we go into our communities and change this for the better, for, for how we would like it to be? And one that has taken off and been really successful in the terms of adoption is to have a code of conduct. That is pretty much expected, although I just looked at the 100 um, most start projects on GitHub, and I, I thought everyone would have a code of conduct, and I did not find that. Even under the top 20, uh, it was only 13 or so that had a code of conduct. So still a little bit of work to do here. One is to identify and then counter toxic behavior address structural changes in our communities that are leading to these pictures that we are seeing, I create identity groups, provide support for the underrepresented um, individuals in our communities so that they have a place of belonging where can, they can talk about the specifics to their experience, improve documentation, that's something I'll talk a bit more about here in, in a little bit, how we can actually go about doing that. Provide space for newcomers, welcome them. Also, localizing efforts, providing support and documentation and conversations in different language, but also avoiding jargon that increases the burden of someone wanting to come in to have to learn this new, new way of talking and what, what are you talking about? So acronyms are, I, I tr in my own work, I always try to avoid acronyms whenever I can. Um, and also, you know, we can take a data-driven approach to learning and improving. Uh, th there's many more things that we can do. And uh, Sal was just asking me about a book that Anita and I are working on where we are collecting a lot of these things and creating um, something that you can pick off the shelf. That's the, the idea. Pick it off the shelf and then you can see, okay, what do I do with my community? So anyway, that's a book. Writing a book is hard. It takes a lot of work. We're not there yet. So anyway, today 
so th these were old surveys. Today, this is the most recent survey that I know of. The Linux Foundation did this, released it two years ago. And I don't know of anyone who has done a more recent study. I see shaking heads, yes. So, and I was just talking with, uh, with the Linux Foundation Director of Research and um, we're not getting an updated version this year either. Uh, also, uh, the, the rationale is let's give it some time for things, for, for these findings to disseminate, for everyone to be aware, and then for things to change before we assess again. Otherwise, people get uh, survey fatigue and so on. So anyway, in the Linux Foundation survey, which found 82% identified as men, 82% uh, felt welcome in open source. Now, isn't that odd that 82% were men and 82% felt welcome? I wonder, I wonder. We also know that 81%, 81%, that sounds familiar as well, um, of people surveyed read and write English, um, other experienced language barriers. 22% disregard that equal opportunities exist. So we have some deniers amongst our communities, which we know and we need to be mindful of. Um, trying to change something, uh, we, we get pushed back. Those are the respondents here. We also see that 30% report that some aspect of their identity was a factor. So, we want to be mindful of everyone and their backgrounds. And so, so knowing what the current state is, and I think I'm not hearing anyone opposing that these numbers are bogus or anything. I want to propose a specific lens, a frame to think about this, and, and one approach that we can take to make a change here. And that is to think about unconscious bias as a problem. There are other problems. This is just one that I propose we look at. And if we are thinking about navigating, there are, there are different approaches that we can take to navigating. One, one, one might be like, I need to know exactly where north is and how many degrees off I am and where the wind is going. And I, very scientific, very numbers driven. Whereas the other one is like, oh, I see a church over there and that's the town hall. So I think we have to go this way and the sun is over here and I'll find my way this way. There are different approaches of going through life different approaches to observing a problem and solving it. And we, we know this. This is what science has shown. It has also shown that these biases in different approaches to life are clustered around the identities of male versus female or men versus women, uh, especially in the technology context. When we look at the motivation, and of course, people land anywhere and this is a continuum, this is not extremes. This is just something that we have seen in the research and where there were enough studies that we could say this is actually significant. It's not just one study, this has been multiple studies that have found these things. When we look at motivation for engaging with technology, men are more likely to want to learn and like it and they're, they're engaged with it, whereas women, typically, are they, they want to accomplish something. That's why they're engaging with it. For computer self-efficacy, men tend to be higher confidence. I, I know technology, I know how to use it. Um, women are less confident about it. And men are like, ah, oh, it's not working. The technology is wrong. Women are like, I, I think maybe I need to learn how to use this. Something is, I, I, I don't understand it quite right. So a different mindset is in here. And then when it comes to attitude towards risk, men tend to be like, oh, well, I'll try it. Oh, it's broken. Oh, I'll try again. Oh, it's broken. Uh, men, women are more like, 
well, I, I try this, but I don't know, this could break something. Maybe I shouldn't try it. For information processing, men are like, oh, I found this tutorial, first step, second step, oh, it failed. OK, let's go back. What did I miss? Women are more, OK, I found this tutorial, Wait, but what if I, I'm missing this? How? That they, they might not, they're like, oh, I want to know the full process before I try it. I want to know what the outcome is going to be um, and understand how the different parts are playing together before I start engaging with the technology. And then this is also goes into the learning by process versus tinkering. Similar example. So there are different approaches that seem to cluster around men and women. And what happens when we have 83% or 95% men who are writing all the documentation, who are writing all the user interfaces, who are building the open source projects? They have their certain way of approaching problems and documenting it, building it for this particular way of working. Someone else comes in, they need something different. It's not providing what they need. That's the unconscious bias. We don't even know that we're building it into open source. And so what we want to do is address this as a diversity, equity, inclusion bug. Just like we do with anything else that is broken in open source, we say it's a bug and we need to find it. We need to discover the bug, understand why it exists, and then resolve it. Now, Ideally, we have everyone test it and give us great feedback, but we can't always do that. And so what we need to do for the discovering is put ourselves in the shoes of someone who thinks different from us. And I'll give you an example here how that works in a second. Then we need to understand it. So in this case, here's an example, we want to fix so someone comes to the community and wants to fix documentation and the instructions in the readme read, well, if you want to contribute to the source code, go over here, set up the development environment, takes you 30 minutes. I just want to change documentation. I don't want to send up the, doc the build environment. This readme is not providing what I need to participate in this project. So through this process of going through the exercise, putting myself in the shoes of someone who wants to do other things with the project, maybe we add something to the README, resolve this DEI bug, and add a section on how to engage in documentation. So that is the, at the very high level an example of what, I'm, what we are proposing here. And the, the approach, we, it's called gender mag, and there's a website with lots of great resources for doing this. So let's go through each step a little bit slower and talk about how to do this. Um, or if you want, we can also have a conversation now. So this is a good, good bro breaking point where I showed you the high level how this works. Do you want me to go into more detail step by step or do you want to have a conversation? And then just foreshadowing so you know what else is coming, I have a second part of this slide deck where we talk about common barriers or diversity with the DI bugs um, and how, how to think about them, where to find them. So lots of options. What would you like to do? Continue or have a conversation? Okay, I see nodding. Let's do that. Continue. All right. So going into these three steps, discover, understand, and resolve. Let's think, the first step is, okay, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who's coming to the project who is not as familiar. So especially if I'm the maintainer, I already know a lot of things about the project. And I need to take that step back and think about, okay, 
someone who comes to the project, where might they engage and for what purposes? So here is a table with some ideas for someone who wants to go to the issue tracker. What might they want to do? Well, maybe they want to find a good first issue to start contributing to. Maybe they want to report a bug with the software. Maybe they want to request a new feature. So let's go through each of those steps and see how would that actually work. Someone who comes for, to the code review system might want to submit a software change for review. Or they might want to respond to a review and update the contribution. So that this would be the second step after they already got the feedback. I'll, I'll leave this table. I don't want to go through each point. The idea is that think about the different parts in the project and how someone might want to, what someone might want to do there. Once we know what goal a newcomer or someone to the project has, we need to describe what are the steps we expect them to take. So for the example of making a change to the readme, well, the first sub goal is to edit the readme file. That's what they want to do. For that, they need to click edit, go through the readme. This is from GitHub, this workflow. They need to edit the readme file, and then they need to describe a commit change and save the commit only to then have the second sub goal of creating a pull request, create a new branch and start a pull request, and then they have to actually create the pull request. As someone who just wants to go in and usually works in Word, they just edit and save and they're done. All this other stuff is way out there. Like, what is going on here? So we'll, we'll get there in a moment. But, but we need to now go, now that we understand the process that we expect someone to go through, put ourselves in their shoes. And there are different, these five dimensions that we talked about earlier, where we can say, okay, we're going to take someone who has enjoyment, uh, or we go who someone wants to accomplish something. Someone who is a comprehensive versus a selective information processing style. And we can compile our personas in different ways so that we can accommodate everyone based on how they approach problems. And then, maybe we have a friend, maybe we have someone else, we team up, because then we can have a conversation about it, we can see more than we see ourselves. Ideally, we have a team of three. That seems to have worked really well in the experiments that the research team was doing. And this is, the next step is, okay, we have some templates, some forms that the team now fills out. They go through the, the problem. They describe the, the scenario and the sub goal. Okay, the first one is we want to edit the readme file. And then, does, does this make sense? Does what the, the person as with these uh, five qualities actually think that this is the step that they need to do? Yes, good, okay, perfect. Maybe or no, and then why do we think it's not the case? Is it because of the way that they approach problems in terms of being selective or comprehensive? Or is it because they are more careful rather than trying things out? And, and we, we wanna keep track of that because that helps us later as we try to figure out how to solve the bug. So we do that for the sub goal and then we do that for the individual steps where we want to make sure that when it says save, and I want to save, then, okay, it makes sense. I want to save, but it says commit. Now I'm confused. And, and we want to be mindful and keep track of that. And then this one is after the action. If the feedback the system gave me confirms that I've done the right thing. <laughs> I love the forms where I click send and I go back to a different website and I don't even know that it submitted the form. I have no confirmation. I hate that. So this is the kind of idea here. Are we getting the right feedback to know that I'm making progress towards my goal? And then we have documented the steps and how someone would approach it and where they stop 
following the process. We can count how many issues that they have. How, how many issues were a reason because of the way they approach problems. Then that's what we call the DI bug. And then we can discuss the solutions. And then we take on a different persona and we, we try it again and we take a different perspective, we try it again. And we basically put ourselves in the shoes of many other different people. It's okay to just do it with two stereotypical people will cover most of the use cases. So you don't have to go really in depth with this. Um, but just taking a different perspective and going through the process and seeing, hmm, I would not have thought of that if I, this is the way I was thinking or approaching problems. So this is discover, understand, resolve uh, DI bugs with the gender mag process. There are lots of research or resources on their website that are available. And now is a good spot where we can talk about this or I can continue on to common DI bugs. Again, the invitation is open for anyone who has something they want to share right now is a good spot. Yes, so here, one second, I'm gonna give you the microphone because we have wonderful people online who also want to hear what you have to say. Okay, so this is great. Like, this is technically how this works, but what you're missing in all this is like the important part of the people, right? So like, uh, I, getting people to get over the technophobia of just making their first commit is hard. Yes. Um, but I do it because I'm really sick of dealing with like people in marketing and HR who are like afraid of what we do for a living, right? I work in this field. So once a year on like the inaugural day, it's like February 7th, like open source day, no matter what company I'm at or with or any other ones that I can get to engage, I'm like, everybody is gonna do like, so I'll say, right, if there's like a women empowerment thing, like all of you can go and put your resources out there, do one commit, just put your name down, do an edit. Yeah. Um, and then two more things that are just things that always work. Um, PR parties, so like literally I'll go out and reach out to a maintainer because I have that network, but if mm -hmm. I'm sponsoring someone into a process, um, you literally like jump on a Zoom and have them do a PR party, like a bunch of people do their first commits, the maintainers come on and have a video discussion or issue discussion and it's live um, because there used to be a time in the olden days where we all were in the same rooms and you just have to re-replicate those, like do extreme programming in open source. Um, but uh, on that note, you can only do a PR party correctly if you use the salt and pepper song, Push It, at the time when. Salt and pepper song? It. And everyone has to do it at the same time. <laughs> um, which is actually, I, I, I will give the microphone back after, after two more thoughts. But when yes. you do these PR parties, it's interesting because like I'll do them with people from all around the world. You actually see that it takes differential time and lag because of the different CDNs. So it's a really nice way of like you're it's a very cool thing. So do that. Um, and then, like, lastly, uh, the coolest thing, because people, it's not about just, like, throwing something up and, like, high-fiving a project one time, right? It's about, like, having a dialogue, a, a mm -hmm. lexiconal discussion around logic. And uh, so when people first use GitHub for the first time and I teach them how to use it, I'll get, like, six people in a room. Uh, we'll set up the GitHub account. We will open up a README, and we will write poetry. And you go in and you edit line by line because it's exactly the same way of thinking. You create, you go in and you edit over someone and you have that process of going in like dialogue. Um, if you do that as the first of the first entry, you have fun. That's your first readme on your GitHub for the rest of your career. It's really cool. All right, there, I'm back online. I love the idea of doing poetry for editing. 
that is fantastic. You take completely the, the fear of coding or anything out, just say, hey, you know, we do something that, that you can do, and we'll just use a different process. So we'll use the GitHub process. I love that. Takes, uh, yeah. Um, one thing that, that you said is the, 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 we actually need to train and, and build that confidence and get people to use the, the tools. And I think those are all really good you know, strategies and things that we need to do. And they're complementary to, to what I was talking about. So yes, I was ignoring it. I was coming at it from a different perspective and angle of saying, hey, we have the project and it might not be ready for someone to come or it might be appalling. <laughs> Some projects are just appalling for people coming. So how do I fix that? I, I've tried everything. And so this is where I'm saying, well, think of being someone else taking a look at the project for the first time, and then we can still do all the other things with the salt and pepper song, was yeah, that? You have to push it. I don't actually know that song. <laughs> I, will, I will play it for you. Okay. <laughs> is the, is the uh, audio hooked up to the laptop if I play it? Because... Oh, no, no, not, not right now. Not right now, okay. <laughs> okay. It's like after hours All right. Yeah. Can you use the microphone, please? For oh, yeah. I guess um, I, I just had a really interesting experience because I committed to creating a new repo for a friend of mine, but then I was also moving this weekend, so I was busy. And so I just chat GPT'd my contributor MD file. It was really good. I was like, hey, what are your best? And it gave me a bunch of guidelines. So like, yeah, there's a lot of like, yeah, I just like cheat coded it and it, it gave me a really good MD file. So. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah. So, uh, in terms of like having your, if you're a maintainer, having your project ready for a PR party and that first time contributor, one thing that I, mean, I have struggled with is having that good roster of good first issues marked and identified. Yes. And I love the fact that GitHub, like that is like default label that is now in any project that you start up. Uh, but having that list there, um, and making sure that those good first issues don't escape into like just head knowledge or just you ha thinking, we're only thinking about big features. We're not thinking about minor bugs or something that was, maybe there's even just something that's out there that a person reported and didn't even like triage and it might be good as someone else who is new, who is just trying your thing for the first time, even for them to like reproduce it and like add a comment and say, yeah, I ran into the same thing that this person did. And then because they are concretely thinking about it, providing that additional context, that is also, I think, an equally, if not more valuable contribution to a project than just code. Um, so that might be something else that's out there. It's not just about the code, it's just the basics of understanding what it is that the project needs to do. Yes. Thank you. I'll pass on the microphone. Yeah, just plus wanting what you were just saying. That the tricky thing too is even if you identify things that you think would be good first issues because maybe they are documentation oriented or it's a bug that requires just a flip in the logic switch or you know whatever. Often those are not all size fits all or whatever one size fits all because you know everybody's applying their own opinion as far as what is a good first issue and one might have like a one liner there we go you know but it, it, it implies that you know a whole bunch of context that you don't right and so yeah. you have to not only think about you know what technically even if you can foresee ah yes the fix to this will be three lines of code or whatever you still have to put yourself do what you were just saying put yourself in the shoes of the person looking for that first issue what are they going to know? You know, if it's their real right. first issue, they probably need a lot of stuff spelled out. So you might need to think about templatizing, like links to your docs that talk about specific things or things of that nature. I feel like uh, you have a direct response. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so I ran into this thing one time. I was just like stalking someone's like private repo, but it was like semi-public private repo, right? It was just their own project. But at the bottom of it, they said, in case anyone else sees this, 
And it was like in narrative form, just a paragraph description of like, and I went to this blog and then I did this thing. And then it was just like a paragraph of everything they had done to get to that executional code understanding. Um, and so now when, when we're at the stage of like finalizing documentation before we go to product, I always request that a like semi-technical, like a technical writer, but not an engineer that has not ever seen that before comes in and because everything executes, what resources do they need to conceptually understand it? Write that paragraph at the bottom. It's so useful and you can interlock your docs that way. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Did you have a thought? Yeah, go for it. Happy to. Uh, yeah, on on the kind of um, on the kind of cross discipline point about like um, actually the the point around replicating the good first issue. Um, I think that's really good for uh, cross discipline engagement with open source because one thing that test engineers ask me all the time or QA engineers you might call them uh, in your org um, is like how how can I contribute to open source like the there's this perception that it is just code and it's only for developers. So identifying those other ways to contribute, I think, is, is really good for, I guess, um, discipline diversity. Um, but also on the point of uh, helping people that are completely new to, to contributing, there was something actually spotted in some of those examples, and it, I think it could go either way. It was uh, the phrasing of the instructions were along the lines of, here are five easy and simple steps to get set up. Now, on the one hand, that might encourage people to try it because it's like, oh, don't be intimidated by it. Mm -hmm. But then if people find it difficult, that might be really disheartening. And most of the advice I've read around things like that is uh, actually try and avoid saying this is easy, this is simple, or like, don't use the word obviously because it might be obvious to you, but it, not someone new to the tech stack or yeah, new to new to open source. Full stop. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. I think that's a really great point. I was just going to add. Um, I teach computer science, and so I work with students all the time. And uh, one alternative that I've used sometimes to some success is to instead of specifying like easy, obvious, etc., to like give a time bound and say like, hey, give this, you know, give this task a shot for 15 minutes. And if then if you're stuck, reach out for help because then it prompts people that like. I mean, I know I've definitely ended up in loops where I've spent three hours trying to figure out something that actually wasn't that I was misunderstanding something. It's that like the docs were bad or the thing was broken, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's one way that we can try and catch people from falling into that, those loops. That's a, <laughs> I like that, that switch that both of you were riffing off each other. Um, because if we say this is easy and that there's a great XKCT on there. Everyone, there are 10,000 people who hear something for the first time each day, if mm -hmm. you make certain assumptions. Everyone, there are so many people who don't have that background, that experience, who, for whom it's new. And so implying that, no, you're dumb because this should be easy is really detrimental. Uh, good point. I like that workaround with give it 15 minutes. So anyway, we are three minutes, two minutes away. I just wanted to give you uh, another quick teaser or, or something to, to think about when it comes to thinking about problems in our community, just a framework. I, I don't want to go into depth given the time. And this is based on, on research with this amazing research team we've done with uh, the Apache Software Foundation uh, sponsored by Google uh, three years ago where we looked at, okay, what's actually uh, preventing people from really contributing. And based on the interviews that we were doing, we also did a survey and looked at uh, some trace data. The interviews based on 19 interviews, uh, we, we arrived at a framework to think about the barriers that people were facing. And we were categorizing those based on agency, where it's a question of who can actually do something about this problem in our project and the type of challenge. Is it a process, technical, or social challenge? So at the foundation level, project level, and individual level versus those. What we found is the majority of challenges were at the foundation and project level. 
not the individual, and then many of those were process related. And once we understand that, we can have some, um, some recommendations for to do about it. And in this study, all the 88 challenges that we discovered were grouped like this in the framework. And there is, as we were grouping those, that you can go to the paper, it's at the bottom, and actually find it. So from the statements in the interviews, like um, it's also not super clear how the idea of rough consensus works and how to proceed if rough consensus cannot be reached. I, that's, that's clearly a process question that is not clearly explained or, or trained. And so knowing these kinds of things, then we can say, okay, at the foundation level, we need to do something about this. Um, and maybe provide tra regular training or provide clear governance uh, documentation or um, so something where, where we bring people into the fold, what that actually means. Um, but I'm at time, there, there are more examples and I'll upload these slides, you can go through those. Um, and here's the process. So thank you so much for, for coming today, being part of this conversation, it's been a pleasure and I always enjoy learning from you.